Good morning and uh, welcome to the um, subcommittee on telecommunications and the internet. Today we are going to have amongst the most important hearings uh, which we can have because today's hearing will focus on the principle of universal service. That principle along with diversity and localism has been a hallmark of telecommunications policy for decades. The Commission has a variety of tools to achieve universal service. It can be achieved and promoted through competition policy, franchising policy, and wireless policy, through both auctions designed to spur competition or mandated build out of networks. And universal service can also be advanced through mechanisms developed under the law to support subsidies for various universal service funds. These funds are currently in four major baskets for rural high cost, for the E-rate program for K through 12 schools and libraries, for the lifeline and link up programs for low income consumers or for rural health care purposes. In analyzing the principle of universal service for the future, I believe it is important to take a step backward and to assess what objectives universal service should now encompass and analyze how existing programs achieve these objectives or how they fail to meet them. Rather than getting right into detailed debates about how to divvy up the existing subsidy pool, question who qualifies for so-called ETC status or tackle the pros and cons of the identical support rule or reverse auctions, policymakers should first discuss why we do any of this at all and examine questions as to why, for whom, for what, by whom, and at what expense. Right now, the four universal service programs spend approximately $7 billion a year. And more than half of it, roughly $4 billion, goes to rural high cost, followed by the E-rate program, which is currently capped at $2.25 billion per year. Consumers pay approximately an 11% surcharge on their interstate and international calls to fund all of this. This is more than double the percentage consumers paid a decade ago. Yet as we look at how to recalibrate the funding mechanisms to more equitably garner funding among industry participants, it is vital that we provoke a conversation about what we believe universal service should be in the 21st century. This will allow us to effectively manage both the imposition of fees as well as justify the eligibility and purpose of disbursements. There are a host of questions to tackle in various areas. For example, what level of service should be supported for rural consumers? Should the supported services include just plain old telephone service or broadband, wireline, or wireless service too? If competition fails to achieve affordability for a particular service in a rural community, should extremely wealthy rural consumers be subsidized or should the program be targeted to assure affordability for non-wealthy consumers in some way? For low-income consumers in non-rural areas, should their supported service or services be comparable to the level of service provided to rural consumers? Today, for example, it is not. A rural consumer in a high-cost area can get multiple lines subsidized, including wireless service, but a low-income consumer in Boston can only obtain one subsidized line. How should Congress or the FCC adjust the program for rural health care? This program has never worked well, and its current statutory construct no longer makes any sense. And what about the future of the schools? and libraries program, for which I coined the term E-rate to emphasize the education rate or educational mission of the program. This is a vital program that George Lucas and I first discussed back in August of 1993. 
Our conversation directly led me to fight to include a provision for discounted rates for schools and libraries in the 1994 telecommunications bill, which I successfully passed through the House, but which died in the Senate that year. The E-rate became law when Congress enacted it in the succeeding Congress as part of the Telecommunications Act. And we have defended it with political lightsabers ever since. Given the fact that requests for E-rate funding outpace the current cap, should the cap now be lifted? Should the nature of supported services be upgraded to include truly high-speed connectivity to schools? Should certain supported services to schools become free of charge to ensure that all schools keep pace in preparing the next generation for the fiercely competitive global economy we now face? Today we face the challenge of how to achieve universal broadband for our nation. Any overarching policy blueprint for universal broadband will be, nece will be by necessity uh, inclusive of universal service as a component. We must look at this task, however, cognizant of the costs consumers will, will be willing to bear, but also mindful of the cost of not acting to upgrade our national telecommunications infrastructure and bringing all Americans along. That must be a critical part of that debate. These are costs to education, health care, job creation, and innovation if the United States fails to develop a plan for our digital broadband future. I look forward to hearing from our truly excellent witnesses today, and I thank them for their willingness to be with us today. And I turn now to recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Smith. Good morning, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding this hearing. It, uh, it's been a long time uh, since we've had a hearing on universal service, and I think all of us look forward to hearing from our witness, and we welcome all of them. I also want to commend uh, the ranking member, Joe Barton, uh, for his uh, efforts to make uh, this uh, hearing and for making uh, universal service a high priority for this side of the aisle. Uh, obviously, all, all of us believe that the universal service needs to be reformed, I think we can all agree upon that point. The system is fraught with uh, overpayment to a lot of companies in the rural areas, as well as the chairman pointed out to the customers who have a 11 percent surcharge, which is double a decade ago. So a major overhaul is necessary. The question before us this morning is what's the appropriate way to do this, and how do we best achieve these aims uh, through this legislation, uh, perhaps? The uh, 96 Telecom Act uh, codified universal service, but the concept goes back decades earlier to a time when there was only one phone company. Now the landscape obviously has changed and the fund is still administered by these outdated rules. The entire country has access to phone service. We have more competition and better technology than ever before. Yet the universal service fund continues to grow and grow. As of last year, the annual cost of the fund was $7 billion, more than $4 billion of which came from the high-cost fund. Universal service fees, as mentioned earlier, now represent 11 percent of the consumer's monthly bill. That's 11 percent. Now is the time to, now is not the time to expand the fund, but rather to reform it. For example, we should impose a firm cap to prevent uncontrolled growth in the fund with a limitless pool of money, carriers have no incentive to operate more efficiently. This subsidy chills innovation by propping up older technologies and carriers and making it harder for new innovators to compete. So throwing additional money at this crumbling program uh, perhaps is not the best way to do it. Moreover, performance measures are needed to ensure